Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you because thus far you have led us in this workers' retreat. We thank you for what we have heard already from your word. And we thank you for the prayers we have prayed and for your response to our prayers. Father, we pray that you continue with us as we continue even now in Jesus' name. Open our eyes to see. Touch our hearts to understand. Mold our will to be willing to do what you want us to do. That at the end of it all, we look back and rejoice that your purpose has been carried out in our lives. In Jesus' name, we pray. In this session now, we come to the timeless, important topic of trials and temptations of saints. Timeless, because in every generation, those who follow God have always faced temptation and trials. Timeless, because in the generation in which we live now, Temptations and trials are still there to check up what kind of people we are. Timeless because even in the future, until we pass from this veil of death and shadow, these temptations and trials will continue to test and to see of what kind of stuff we are made spiritually. And very important, because the outcome of the temptation and the trial will determine where we will be now. Whether we will be in the favor, in the pleasure of God, remaining in the kingdom of God. And where we will be in future, whether we will be separated forever from God and from the people of God, or we will be with God. So then, this timeless and important message, temptations and trials of saints, is what is arresting our attention now. Born as sinners, God makes provision that we can become the saints of God. And we have to settle, first of all, to realize that we have become saints. That through the process and through the grace of God, and through that conversion experience, we have been turned from sinners unto saints. You know this already, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If everybody had sinned, and everybody had come short of the glory of God, how was it that some are being called the saints of God? These were the people who realized they were sinners, and they came to confess their sins unto the Lord. And as a result of that confession and forsaking of their sins, their sins were forgiven. As a result of that forgiveness, their names changed. They were no more sinners, but now they have become fellow citizens in the kingdom of God. Or they have become disciples, followers of Jesus Christ. Or they have become the regenerate, that is, those who are regenerated and those who have been forgiven. They have become the saints of God. In Psalm 50. Psalm 50. Looking at verse 5. Gather my saints together unto me. Those that have made a covenant with me. By sacrifice. These are the people that are called saints. Those that have made sacrifice with God. God by sacrifice 
sorry, they have made covenant with God by sacrifice. In the Old Testament, it was the sacrifice of an animal. Because that was what God ordained. That somebody felt he was a sinner. He knew the judgment of God. He knew the wrath of God upon him as a sinner. He will bring a sacrifice. Confess his sins. And then slaughter that animal. The animal became his substitute to take away the guilt of sin. And to take away all the pollution of sin. That now he will say he was free. As we come on to the New Testament, the sacrifice is a higher sacrifice. A greater sacrifice. The sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are taken away. One, the penalty of sin is removed. You will not come to condemnation again. You are passed from death unto life. Not only that, you have peace with God now. Because being justified by faith, you have peace with God. Two, not only that the penalty has been removed, the pollution, the dirt, and the guilty feeling, everything has been removed too. Not only that, the power of sin is broken. And as this power of sin is broken, you have genuine salvation. And it is this genuine salvation that makes you to live free from sin. You become a saint of God. Gather my saints together unto me. Those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. In Psalm 37. From verse 27 to verse 30. Depart from evil and do good. And dwell forevermore. For the Lord loveth justice, judgment. And forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever. But the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom and his tongue talketh of judgment. It says in verse 28 that God does not forsake his saints. Who are these saints? Verse 27, those who have departed from evil. Who are these saints? Verse 27. Those who have received grace to do good. Who are these saints? Verse 27. Those who now dwell in the presence of God. And they have the consecration and commitment. They intend dwelling in the presence of God forever. Who are these saints? In verse 28. They are the people who have got the power to be preserved in righteous relationship with the Lord. Who oh, are these saints? Verse 28. They are the people that are different from the wicked that shall be cut off. Who oh, are these saints? The righteous that shall inherit the land according to the promise of God. Who oh, are these saints? They are the people that their language, their conversations have, have even changed. And you find that the mouths of these saints, righteous people, speak wisdom. And their tongue talk of the judgment, the justice of God. In Romans chapter 1, verse 7. Romans chapter 1, verse 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, called to be saints, these are the people that have received the call of God out of darkness into light. Come unto me, they have heard. All ye that labor on a heavy laden, I will give you rest. And they have responded to that call of God. And as they come into the kingdom of God, they are told, the call is not an ordinary call. The call is not an ordinary call to make you live in an ordinary manner. Now you are called to be saints. Live like a saint. How does a saint live? In Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 1. Be ye followers of God as their children and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us 
and has given himself for us an opening and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smiling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. How do saints live? They live righteously. How do saints live? They live like dear children of God, following after the example and the life of God. How do saints live? They walk in love, as Christ also has loved us. How do saints live? They live free from fornication, free from uncleanness, free from covetousness, free from adultery, free from sin. That is the life that befits or becomes a saint of God. To move from being a sinner to being a saint, we need conversion. Once somebody has been a sinner, but now is a saint, what has taken place in his life is that there has been a conversion. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Acts 3, 19. Repent ye therefore, and be ye converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Those who are called saints are those who have been converted from being sinners to being new creatures. And this conversion means that their sins have been confessed by them, forsaken by them, therefore blotted out by God. And a time of refreshing is now to come unto them from the presence of the Lord. James chapter 5. Verse 19 and verse 20. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him. It's not only the sinner that has never known the Lord, never known the gospel, never known the church, never seen the Bible, that needs conversion. If one of us, one of us brethren, one of us children of God, one of us who have been called by the name of God, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, if any of us has gone away from the truth, in his own life, he has deviated from the truth. In his marriage, he has deviated from the truth. In his conduct, he has deviated from the truth. In his marketing and in his business, he has deviated from the truth. In relationship, Yet association, he has deviated from the truth. Or in his manner of lifestyle, appearance, or dressing, he has deviated from the truth. If any of you err from the truth, in his preaching, in his presentation, in his belief, he has deviated from the truth. If any of you err from the truth, and one convert him, do you know that he needs conversion? That a backslider needs to be turned to God again. It says, let him know that he that he which converted the sinner. Remember in verse 19, is called one of us. It's called a believer. It's called one of the brethren. But then the moment he debated from the truth, he became a sinner. And when the word of God comes to him now, and now he repents all over again and confesses all over again and forsakes all the sins once over, once over again, he says, God, I'm sorry, I know I've gone astray. Now what happens now, we are told, he that converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death. It is this restoration that saves him from the second death. If he doesn't repent, after backsliding, is going to die. And if he dies in sin, is going to suffer forever and ever and shall hide a multitude of sins. In Acts chapter 26 and in verse 18. Acts 26, verse 18. To open their eyes. And to turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan unto God. That they may receive forgiveness and forgiveness of sins and inheritance 
among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Compassion then takes us from darkness to light. It takes us from evil and sin to righteousness. Conversion brings us from the way of hell to the way of heaven. Conversion is what takes us away from the way of the world to the way of the cross. From Satan to Christ the Savior. Conversion takes Satan's slave away from him. This sinner has been a slave of the devil. Conversion takes this slave and tells Satan, this is not your slave anymore. He wants to follow the Lord. Conversion takes Satan's property from him. You see, Satan has been laying hold, laying claim to the sinner, saying, he belongs to me completely. But when conversion takes place, he is turned from the power of Satan unto God. He is taken away from darkness, is brought into the light. So actually, conversion deprives the devil of his slave, of his servant, of his property. What then will Satan do? Knowing that he has lost a slave. Knowing that the one that had been serving him before is now gone away from him. This is what brings temptation and trial. The devil will endeavor by means of temptations and trials to bring that saint, that child of God, that one who has been taken away from the hands of the devil, to come back to the devil and to come back to perdition and punishment. In Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 11 from verse 24, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none, he says, I will return unto mine house. Whence I came out, here is the devil, here is the demon, the evil spirit, laying claim to this individual as his house. And he said, this unclean spirit had gone out of the man. But then, find, wanting to have rest and seeking rest, finding none, he says, I will return. I will return to my house. Whence I came out, and when he cometh, he findeth his swept and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh unto him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter in, and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. That is, Satan wanting to regain entry into that life again. Isn't that what you find illustrated in Exodus chapter 14? After Pharaoh had let the people go, had released those slaves, eventually he questioned and said, what have we done? Why have we allowed the people to go? And so began trial for the children of Israel. In Pharaoh trying to reclaim, trying to repossess the people once again. Exodus chapter 14, from verse 5. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? That we have let Israel go from serving us. Why have we done this? That we have let Israel go from being our slaves. From being our servants. That's exactly the attitude of the devil. When a soul has been converted, turned from sin unto righteousness. He says, why have we let this individual go? Why have we released him to Christ? Why have we allowed him to take that decision to become a Christian? Why have we allowed him to become a child of God, a pilgrim on the way to heaven rather than a candidate of hell? And in verse 6, and he made ready his chariot and took his people with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. His intention was to make sure that he brought the people back. 
And this is the intention of the devil whenever he brings temptation. The purpose of the tempter is to reoccupy his old house. To reoccupy his old house. The purpose of the tempter of the devil is to repossess a slave or to bring the saint back, back to sin, back to evil, back to darkness, back to bondage, back to perdition. We consider three points in the message. Number one, temptations and trials from Satan. Temptations and trials from Satan. Number two, consequence of failure and falling. Consequence of failure and falling. Number three, the triumph and reward of faithful pilgrims. The triumph and reward of faithful pilgrims. Temptations and trials from Satan. We must understand that temptations come from Satan. In James chapter 1, from verse 13. James chapter 1, verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Here we have the Definition of temptation. That temptations are enticements from Satan to appeal to our flesh, to appeal to our weakness, to appeal to our desires and needs and problems, and thereby, if he can, make us fall and turn away from God. A temptation is an enticement from the devil. To appeal to your flesh, appeal to your weakness, appeal to the secret desires in your life, appeal to your needs and appeal to your problems, and thereby, if you can, turn you away from God, and make you to fall. Look at James chapter 1 verse 13 again, let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Let no man say, when he is tempted... Well, maybe God doesn't want me to get to heaven after all. Maybe it was because I just forced myself into the kingdom of God. I repented and called on the Lord. Maybe actually God doesn't even want me to have any kind of relationship with him. I'm, I'm the only one that is just making an effort wanting to serve the Lord. Maybe I'm not one of those people that are predestined to be a child of God. And so God now has brought this temptation to me so that God will say, there you are now because you are falling. I'm not going to take you to heaven again. He says temptation is not from God. Temptation to evil. Enticement to evil. Invitation to commit sin. It's not coming from God. And so you cannot say when temptation comes, well, you say, well, the will of the Lord be done. Well, the will of the Lord is that you live a victorious life. When temptation comes your way, you cannot say, well, I don't know what God wants. I don't know whether he wants me to yield to this. I don't know the intention of God in bringing this temptation to me. Let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempted he any man. Neither tempted he any man. Then in verse 14, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lost and enticed. What the Bible is saying here is that there is something within every individual. It is called lost, or it is called desire, 
or it is called ambition, or it is called a wish. I wish I had this. I wish I had that. I wish I were there. I wish I were here. It is that thing from within, like a magnet within. If that magnet is not insulated, if that magnet is not a kind of preserve so that it doesn't draw all these things from outside, you will find that you are drawn away, drawn away of your own lust and enticed. And enticed. The devil begins to make you hear that kind of music. And there is something within you that wants it. That relishes it. That wants to enjoy it. Then you are drawn away and enticed. The devil makes you to see a particular object. And there is something within desiring it. Wanting it. I wish it were mine. And you are drawn away of your own desire. And you are enticed. The devil makes you to hear of a particular company, of a particular trade, of a particular possession. And then you wish, you say, I wish I possessed it. I wish I had it. And you are drawn away. There's a thing within you that when you hear that thing, you see that thing, you feel that thing, or you experience that thing, you are drawn away and enticed. And enticed. Then it says, when lost as conceived. When lost as conceived. This is using a pictorial language. That you can make that lost to be barren. You can make that lost not to be fed with what the lost is looking for. And then when that temptation comes, that enticement comes, that drawing away comes, you starve that thing. You do not allow the loss or the desire or the drawing from within to be in contact with that thing. You stop it. You don't allow it to get conceived. But then it says, if you will feed on that thing, if you keep on looking at that thing, if you keep on thinking about that thing, if you keep on desiring that thing, if you keep on examining that thing, can't I have it? What is wrong in it after all? Are all the Christians not doing it? Is it as bad as I'm thinking about? Will this take me from the kingdom of God? Can't I do it and still retain my position in the kingdom of God? Then you are drawn away and lost as conceived. Then eventually if it's conceived, it's going to bring forth something. Is going to bring forth a result. The child of temptation is seen. And the child is going to come eventually. It bring forth, it bring it forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bring it forth death. You see, when temptation comes, temptation is not sin in itself. When temptation has come, you have not committed sin. But then it is when you have been drawn away by your lust and you are enticed and you give in and eventually you do that thing, you take that thing, you go that place or you put on that thing, eventually you are yielding to the temptation and it becomes sin. In Joshua chapter 7, from verse 19. And Joshua said unto Achan, my son, Give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel. Make confession unto him. And tell him now, what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And thus and thus have I done. I want you to now see the illustration of what we read in James chapter 1. One, we read that God does not bring this kind of temptation to any man. We have read that God desires all of us to remain in the kingdom of God. And when this temptation to evil comes, it is not God that has brought it unto us. Not only that, we have read that when temptation comes, we are drawn, we are enticed of our own lust. And eventually it is conceived and it brings forth sin. And sin brings forth death. See the processes here. From the beginning of the chapter we are told that God was unhappy with the children of Israel. 
And he told Joshua that the children of Israel have sinned, and because of that, he will no, no more be with them. Telling us that the temptation was not brought by God. It wasn't the work of God. It came from another source. And now, being drawn away, look at verse 21. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted. Here he can say, I saw that thing. No doubt it is possible that many other Israelites saw that too. Because you see they won the battlefield. And when all these uh, people in Jericho, when they died, as the wall came down, there were many Babylonian garments everybody could have seen. That wasn't the problem. And as we are here, we see many things in the places of war. We hear many things from many, many people. And there are many suggestions that are given by unbelievers. Why not try this? Why not try that? Many people hear many things. Hearing is not the problem. Seeing is not the problem. But then, when I saw among the spoils, that is among the results and the booties of the war, a goodly Babylonish garment, Babylonish garment, not Israelitish garment, Babylonish garment, goodly Babylonish garment. So these Babylonians are so talented, are so colorful that they can do all this embroidery upon a kind of cloth. I saw it and I said, these Babylonish people, so they have beautiful things like this, goodly things like this. And then I began to look at what I was wearing as an Israelite. And I said, ah, ah, even these Babylonians, they have something better than we Israelites. And then he said, I also saw 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold. Then he said, I coveted. There was something in me that I was having the desire. That said, I think I need this. I think there's something in me that wants this. I think there's something in me that will appreciate this. I don't think I will be happy without this. I think this thing will contribute to my joy, to my happiness. You see, it's been drawn away and being enticed because of his desires. I said temptation is something that comes, that appeals to your flesh, appeals to your eyes appeals to your taste appeals to your weakness appeals to your desires and needs and problems and then he said i coveted them and then he said eventually i took them i took them sin was getting conceived in the coveting and eventually sin was born as he took them and it says behold they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. Now as an Israelite, really there was no occasion for him to wear that Babylonish garment because if he did, everybody will know. He will die for it. He took it and he couldn't use it. Do you know the people that steal and they cannot even spend the money? Do you know the people that will take something? Here we are now, for example, you see somebody that has a large, big Bible. And they ask you, maybe the people, the person went to the uh, kitchen to bring something. And before the fellow came back, you have been looking at that Bible. And then you touched it and then you opened it. And you saw that the lettering and the center references, uh -uh, I've never seen like this before. And then you open and you saw some colorful pictures in that Bible. Say, ah, this one is wonderful. They say, what am I going to do? So the fellow came back while you are looking at it. They say, now, uh, bring the food down, bring the food down. The fellow was coming, so you close the Bible and look the other direction. And while we're looking for other things, the fellow went again to uh, go and get maybe water or something. Then you say, ah, this Bible. Even the letter, even the color, even everything that I see there. And then you opened it again, and when you opened it, you saw a particular page there. They say, who gave you, and to whom was it given, on what date, and the date of father, the day of the, uh, you know, the mother, the name of mother, the name of son-in-law, the name of father. They put all this, you say, my Bible doesn't have this kind of thing. And the fellow was coming again, you closed to it. And now your heart has been saying, now, where did they even get this kind of Bible? Even if I have the money to buy it, where will I buy it? 
how can I have this thing? And while the fellow was bringing water again, you closed it and looked the other direction. And then eventually now they said, pack all this place and pack all these bowls and take them back to the kitchen. And so the fellow being, you know, he got to serve the Lord. He just, you know, packed all the things. And while he went away, then you looked at the end of it. They said that these are the subjects, index, and these are the concordance. You say, what? Any verse you are looking for, you just open that part of it. You say, this is a Bible. Hmm. Let me help myself. Maybe this is why I came to work as retreat to discover something like this. And then you took it and then you left that place and go and sit at the back. And the fellow came back and while the fellow came back looking for his wife, I said, rise up, let us pray so the fellow could not shout. He just rose up and we prayed and while I was preaching, he kept quiet but he's looking for his Bible. And then you go and hide it under. You cannot use it at the retreat here because the person that has it may see it and say, ah, where did you get uh, this kind of Bible? Let me see the name there. So you hide it. You take it, but you cannot use it. If you take it to the district, since we know you that you are like a new combat, and we know the you know, little uh, six naira Bible you have been using all these years, and then you now come with a big Bible that a primary school child will need to carry on the head. We say, ah, where did you see this load? You will not be able to use it. And therefore, Achan, the same thing. Achan took everything and he hid it in the tent. Why do people steal when they cannot even wear the Babylonish garment? Why do people steal when they cannot even benefit from what they are doing? You know, the people that uh, covet things and want to take things and want to go into sin, and yet they do not have the time. They are almost dying. They are saying, when can I wear this Babylonish garment? When will I get the benefit of this sin that I have stolen? There is no chance. And yet to have committed sin, in yielding to that temptation. And then eventually we are told that the man died the dead. Died the dead. Because... When sin is conceived, was the result? Death. Verse 25. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with souls, and burnt them with fire. After they had stoned them with stones. That's temptation, and that's yielding to temptation. Temptation comes from the devil to lead astray, to entice, to make you desire what is wrong. In Proverbs chapter 6, Proverbs chapter 6, from verse 24. To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flat tree of the tongue of a strange woman, Lost not her after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a warish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress shall will haunt for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom, and his clothes not be burnt? Can one go up on hot coals and his feet not be burnt? Here is talking of another kind of temptation. But once again, remember that temptation is an enticement from Satan. It can use anything. It can use anyone. But the temptation is an enticement from Satan to appeal to your flesh, to appeal to your sight. To appeal to your weakness. To appeal to your desires. Every man, every woman has some desires. And these desires relate to various things in life. And the devil appeals to all these desires. And it says in verse 24. That women talking about women who tend. And women who yield themselves as instruments in the hands of the devil. And use the flat tree of the tongue. The flat tree of the tongue. And if that is what you desire, you desire cheap praise. You desire cheap recognition. And you desire flattery. The devil is going to use that cheap praise and uh, cheap recognition and flattery. 
to make you go into what you shouldn't go into. It's lost not after her beauty in thine heart. Remember, please, that there's something in your own heart. Something in your own heart. That when you see an individual, and you will say, your own heart will say, the fellow is beautiful. Actually, beauty is relative. It depends on what you are looking at and the way you are looking at it. To one that is being enticed, this fellow looks beautiful. To another person who is not being enticed, the fellow is not beautiful. He's neither ugly nor beautiful, just a human being. And there is nothing in the heart that is drawing to an evil thing. But you see, when the temptation is very, very intense upon you, the one that is ugly will look beautiful. The one that is dirty, you know, that will not matter. Being dirty will not matter to you because of the temptation. So it says, lost not after her beauty in thine heart. And you see, as we go to our places of work, and as we go to the markets, and as we go in our various communities, we see a lot of women. In fact, you know, because of the un unemployment in this country right now, it appears that women try to make ends meet in various ways. And how do they do it? You know you how they do it because, you know, the ordinary salary they are getting in their places of work will not survive, will, will not get the job done. And so you will find a lot of these uh, women that they are the, you know, where there is a bus stop or where there is a corner somewhere or where there is uh, maybe a crossroad somewhere. You see them and that they are wearing their slacks and they are having their faces painted and everything there and they stand in there. And as they stand there, they beckon to the people or they smile to the people or they wave to the car owners. Or if you are not a car owner, you are just passing your way. Uh, they may just uh, ask you, uh, excuse me, sir, what's the time now? And as you are trying to answer what's the time now, makes space to you and tries to, you know, interest you and tries to say this and that. Or it may be that, you know, the lady with all the slacks and with all the shorts that they put on and they stand. Sometimes they stand two by two or three by three or they stand as individual in these various places and say, excuse me, sir, uh, would you know the place to the street so and so? Actually, they are not concerned about the street. They are concerned about you. And here you are. You try to answer that because you as a Christian, you like to be gentle and as a Christian, you don't put two and two together. You don't reason at all. And, you, and since you know the street, you say, well, if you cross that way, and you cross that way, you will get to the place. And the lady is ready for another question. Um, if I cross that way, what do they call the street there? And if I'm going to turn to the other side, is that a lane or avenue or a crescent or... I'm trying to remember a particular kind of uh, name, street I got from. So you see, this address I have, I'm trying to uh, get the place. And um, uh, I'm sorry to bother you and to impose myself on you, but can you take me to the place if you say it's just there? I've been, I've been in that place, you know, some five minutes ago. I search, I search, I search. And here you are, you're a Christian. And you like to go the extra mile. When Jesus said, if they take you a mile, go the extra mile, he, did, he wasn't telling you that if Satan takes you a mile, go the extra mile, never move, move a yard, an inch was the devil. That passage is not applicable to the devil. And never move an inch was the tentress. And you say, well, you live where you are going, maybe you are going with a particular brother. Say, bro, uh, I will, you know, we have to do good. So I want to take this lady to that street. And while you are going, and the, you know, woman begins to talk. Oh, you are so nice, and you are so gentle. From where are you? And you say, well, I'm a Christian. And this woman, they have taught her, you know, all this, they have their techniques. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And then you say, are you a Christian too? You better believe it. I'm a Christian also. And you are trapped. And then before you know what, you already are beginning to appreciate. And you are beginning to say, this kind of person. And this kind of person, it says, lost not utter a beauty. What seems to be beauty, what looks like beauty. Don't even desire it. Don't even lust after that in your own heart. It starts from the heart. 
Let her not take you. Let her not trap you with her eyelids. You see, they put all these lashes and they put this one and they put this other one. And you know these people in your offices, especially, you know, you are, here you are, you are a manager or director. And maybe you have no choice. They have invited all these people and they have employed them. And these people will put something on the cheek here, something on the cheek here, eyelash here, and this other one here, and something on the finger, and the ear is this way, and all that. And the dress, you know, those tailors, the designers, they do it for a purpose. They will make, they will cut the dress this way and cut the dress that way. That if you look this direction, you see what you shouldn't see. If you look at the back, you see what you shouldn't see as well. And eventually, you know, this fellow is his secretary. And every time when, if somebody, you know, wants to do something, will come and trip a little and walk this way and miss that way. And then speak in a kind of a language, in a kind of English that we didn't learn in Nigeria. And after they have done that, your heart, something is jumping in your heart. And you are saying, well, but they said we shouldn't commit sin. They said we should prepare to get to the kingdom of God. They said Jesus can come at any time. Uh, but uh, well after all God is a merciful God after all if somebody commits sin God will forgive and uh, already there is something in your own heart that means that already you are going astray you see temptation comes to people and your places of work where you go you know the various temptations that come to you you know the various things that the people do that will lure you and entice you into evil and you know the reason why you have to be praying for salvation every Sunday while you go to the place of work, you have been enticed. You have been led astray. And you have been trapped in the evil, in the sin of the system. And when you come on Sunday, if they mention salvation, again you want to get saved. And then you go back to the place of work again because of the enticement, because of the temptation. Again you go back into that thing. You are never sure of your salvation. How can somebody be coming to a church like this? Five years and never be sure of salvation is because of what is happening outside there. It's because of what is going on outside there. If it were not because of what is going on outside there, we come in, we get saved, and we are saved. And you rejoice in that salvation. And you don't have to be coming back and in the night when you are having quiet time, God, I am sorry again. I'm sorry again. And then you go back to the place of work. You come back the following evening. Lord, I'm sorry again. What are you sorry for? What are you sorry for? You are nailing Christ to the cross afresh. And you say you are sorry. You never stop it. You are still, you are still driving that nail in the hands of Jesus Christ. Every night, every day. All the time coming back. I am sorry. I am sorry. I am sorry. I think the time will come when God will say, Don't come and say that here again. Go if you want to go into the world totally. You drive the nails in the hands of Jesus Christ, my only begotten son, by your sin, by yielding to temptation. And every time you come here to say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. When are you going to change? I believe the time of change has come. That during this retreat, we'll look up to God and we'll say, Lord, no matter the enticement and no matter the temptation, I am not going to yield to the devil. And you will not yield to the devil in Jesus' name. I'm looking at Judges chapter 14. Judges chapter 14. I'm looking at it from verse 1. And, Sam, and Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Here again we are. And saw, and saw, and saw. Many of us who have not got married, here was Samson. A judge. Here was Samson, a person raised up of God to bring judgment upon the Philistines, afflicting the people of God. But then Samson saw the enemies of God, enemies of his nation, enemies of righteousness, and then said, I saw a woman in Timnath. I want you to think about this judge, powerful judge. And the children of Israel, I'm sure you know that it's like in the church today. Whenever you see somebody that has the word of God, they, if you're a child of God yourself, there'll be an appreciation for somebody having the word of God. You, have, you see somebody that has the anointing of the spirit of God and the power of God, there'll be an appreciation in your heart for somebody having the spirit of God, the power of God. I'm sure that something, as a person that has the power of God, 
with all those women in the land of Israel, I'm sure it will not have been difficult for him to marry in Israel. But can you think about it? That Samson did not see any woman in Israel that pleased him. And you know there are people like that today in all this church with all the thousands and thousands of women that we have. And it has amazed me how God has blessed this church. And uh, you know in Lagos here alone, uh, it's, it's even difficult to have a single meeting for the women that are in this church. So many of them. But you know that as many as they are, there are some men, they cannot find a single woman in this church they can get married to. Because, you know, they don't like how these people, these women, they just dress ordinarily, without the jewelry, without the painting, without the mask, and without all the, all the evil things that the people have, and without all this, you know, this textile industry has gone mad. Textile industry in this present age and generation. If you see the kind of textile things they are producing, if you go to the market and see the kind of things they produce, and the kind of colorful things, and you know, some of them, you touch them, it will be like what we used to, what we used to have when you want to wrap Christmas, uh, you know, Christmas gift. And we'll be making sound like uh, it's not paper, it's not clothes, you say, what material is this? It will look as if they are put, uh, you know, this kind of uh, permanent, uh, eternal starch on it that you fold it it cannot fold i mean different kinds of clothes today that people have and different kinds of pictures they draw the picture of animal they draw the picture of idol they draw the picture of a native land they draw pictures 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 and they write a lot of things with uh, you know different kinds of colors and then these uh, people they say they are christians that is what they are looking at but the sisters that dress normally to please the lord to obey the bible to follow the word of god these men they cannot find any woman to marry in this large church i think we should even call the people of the world to come and judge let them come that let them see that this is only part of workers retreat in lagos alone and let the sinners come to a midst and we tell all the sisters to stand up please can you do me a favor i like practical when i teach uh, you know, when I, when I was in school and they taught us teaching, uh, there was a time they gave us, they said we should do practical. And we went out to do practical. Let me do practical. Women, can you stand up? Here we are. Some men can't get anybody to marry. And all those people outside in the world, you can see down, sisters. God bless you. And God will continue to bless you. You see some brothers, all they are looking, I've seen a woman in Timnath, I've seen a woman in Timnath, I've, I've seen a woman in Timnath. There are 12 tribes in Israel. There are more than 120 districts in this Lagos church in deeper life. All those 120 districts and we have states and regions all over Nigeria. In fact, it's difficult to even count the number of women, the number of sisters in deeper life in this whole country. There are some brothers that the devil has blinded their eyes. They cannot see anybody to marry. And it's in a, in a village, dirty village somewhere, that they will say, I saw somebody. Zona leader, can you help me? I, I don't know what the church will say to this, but actually, when I was praying, and I had this dream, and I saw this uh, woman in our village, and I said, no, no, I'm a Christian. I must not marry a non-believer. But God told me that, no, that is my will. You are a deceiver. You are a deceiver. You are like something that will say, I saw a woman in Timnath with all the women in Israel. May God deliver us in Jesus' name. And then he said in verse 2, and he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me to why. Here we are. You see, there are people, they yield to the temptation. You see, temptation once again is an enticement. An enticement that will draw a person, draw the heart of a person unto evil. Eventually, you know, they cheated him. Because as he was planning the marriage, there's no time to read the whole story. If you go into the world to plan marriage, those people are going to cheat you. Yes, they will cheat you. And of course, you will not escape giving alcohol. You will not escape all the things they are going to be asking of you. 
at the end of the whole thing, when they have scraped your head, you will be disappointed. So this man was eventually disappointed. Of course, he got angry. What do you expect? And eventually, he, he didn't stop there. He didn't stop there. Once you begin to look at those women in the world, you are not going to stop there if you, are, if you even get disappointment. And so eventually, he got one. And he, then, he got the one that destroyed him. Something powerful, mighty, with the Spirit of God. But those women in the world, oh, thank God for the church. You know, these uh, women in the church, they are not as clever as those women in the world. These women in the church, uh, if you say, I see the will of God, they run to coordinator, they run to, they run to marriage committee. And once the marriage committee threatens them and says, if you go that direction, if you marry an unbeliever, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Those people in the world, you try it, Delilah will teach you a lesson. And eventually, uh, Samson saw another one again. And went to this Delilah, this one now a harlot, a prostitute. And this woman began to say, you say you love me, why don't you tell me your secret? Why don't you tell me this? And Samson of all people began to tell lies. Began to tell lies. Remember, Samson was a judge in Israel. Somebody that should be in a particular mansion in Jerusalem. And all these other Israelites will be serving him as the leader of the whole nation. He was in a prostitute's room, house. And eventually when he, he told him, he told her the whole story. The woman said, come this time. He has told me all his heart. And they removed this air and removed his power. And then said, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he rose up, wanting to do like before. But the power had gone. The anointing had gone. And the beauty and the glory of God had gone. You know what happened? Let me read it to you. In Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16. I'm reading to you from verse 19. And she made him sleep upon her knees and she called for a woman for a man and and she caused him to shave up the seven locks of his hair stop there for a moment and let's talk together and now you men when you go to the barber's shop and the barber you see this uh, in this uh, world now there are modern equipments that they can use in removing your hair and it doesn't feel painful at all. But I think that if they are cutting your ear, I don't think you will sleep. I think you will still be awake. Am I right? But here is a man. And you have been, we have been cutting the ear. You don't know how many times now. Maybe once in two months, once in three months. And you have done it so many times in life. And yet if somebody still cuts your ear now, you will know. This man has never, never, never had a single ear cut. So cutting air for him was a strange thing. And yet this Delilah made him to sleep and rubbed him to sleep so much that until they cut off everything, what had never happened, this man never woke up. What happened to this man? I mean, you see, these people of the world, I don't know what Delilah used, but these people of the world today, they can use anything on you. Once you take the first step, wants to show the interest in these women of the world wants to show the false interest they can use a familiar spirit they can use pills they can use anything and they can mix something for you to drink that is not is not poison to poison you it just to make you lose your senses make you lose your alertness and once you get into it if you ever get delivered it will take the cross of jesus christ and so this man he slept. And the woman called a man and said, He is under my control. I have made him sleep that he cannot wake up. I mean, the man should have been afraid. What if I am cutting his ear and this powerful man wakes up with the jawbone of an ass? He can kill you and me. He said, Don't worry. I have got him. I said, I got him. If the women of the world get you, you are gone. You know, we try to get you and discipline you and you we don't, we're not even able to do it properly. You argue with us. If they get you in the world, you will not escape. That's why you need to run away from temptation with all your strength. And eventually when the air is cut off, 
Look at what the Bible says in that verse 19. In the latter part of verse 19. And she began to afflict him. She began to afflict him. She began to afflict him. That is this ordinary woman. <laughs> Something. Of all people. With the power of God. His birth was prophesied by an angel. He be, she began to afflict, afflict him. And his strength went from him. Uh, you know, before you can have the power of God in your life, first of all, you go to the cross, and you pray, and you cry, and you repent, and you dedicate yourself to the Lord. Eventually, God gives you salvation. The journey has only started. Then you pray and pray and consecrate. You get sanctified. And that's not the end of the journey. Then you want the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Baptism in the Holy Ghost. And here you come. You pray, you cry, you seek the Lord, you read the Bible, you read tracts, you listen to cases, you have prayer partner, you go to night video, you do everything. Eventually you have the Holy Ghost baptism. So think of how long it took you to have all those experiences. Five minutes, a woman can take everything from you. Yielding to temptation. You know, before you became a worker, you, before you became an area leader, interview upon interview. Before you became zona leader, interview upon interview. And if you are going to become coordinator, you feel form, you do interview, come today, come tomorrow. Do you notice the question you will dribble you eventually by, you know, by prayer, by consecration. You almost did not get the opportunity. Now you have the opportunity, do you know, with all that you have labored. So you can become somebody, something in the kingdom of God. In one single event, Delilah can take everything away from you. When you think about all that temptation can do, and you think about what temptation can do in your life, how you should be very, very careful concerning temptation. And we're told in verse 20, and she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. You think that these women of the world love you? No, they don't. There's no love in the world. And uh, you know in the church here, if you get married, Let's say you are married in the church and you have little difficulty or even big difficulty. And you report to your coordinator. And your coordinator calls your wife and he says, we married uh, both of you in this church and you know you are doing this. This is not good. This is the word of God. Let's even say for a moment that the wife uh, says, no, I don't accept that. And then I hear about it. I say, call her for me. And then I hear sister uh, what's your name and uh, what's the problem and then you tell me the problem I say sister I'm the pastor here and this is the word of God go back home don't make trouble go and apologize to your wife and uh, to your husband so the woman will say pastor that man too is not living right I say listen to me go back home apologize to your husband because the pastor has said it because this is the word of God and this woman will go back and you know, say, well, I'm very sorry. I've seen the pastor. I've seen the error of my... Whatever problem we have, I think by the grace of God, we're doing well. We're solving the problems. Look at the families in this church. Those who are married. And by the grace of God, God is giving us the wisdom to keep you to stay together. But if you marry a person that is an unbeliever, and she begins to torment you, and she begins to torture you, and she begins to find juju to... to to knock your head. And in the night, all your dreams, you see lion, you see goat, you see serpent, you see your old father that died. In the dream, it appears that you are running like this, you get, you jump into river, you come out, you jump into fire. And you wake up in the morning, you, you say, my wife, if you saw what I saw tonight, what did you see? I jumped into water, I jumped into fire, and the wife will say, you have just started. <laughs> you're married, you're married. And I, and I told you, I told you, I will show you that I am not an ordinary woman. And then you run to me and say, Pastor, 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 I am in trouble. And you tell me all your trouble. And I say, go and call the woman. And you get back home, you say, eh, my wife, our pastor is called. You say, who is your pastor? And you say, then you mention my name, then... When you mention my name, you say brother so and so. He doesn't. He removes the brother and then mentions my name and turns the name aside and say, "Go and tell him." 
I'm not one of the people that is deceiving with Bible born again. Go and tell him. If you go and tell him and tell any other, I'm going to torment you in this house, you will see Pepe. Then you run back to me, you say, the woman refuses to come. In fact, the woman began to blaspheme and began to use your name in a bad way. And I said, uh, where did you get the woman? And you said, I got her, I got her in our village. Oh, I say, no wonder. You got something. You got something. That's why we need to be patient and not allow temptation. Temptation coming from the devil. Temptation coming from the flesh. Temptation that will destroy our lives. I pray that after this workers retreat, we shall stand in Jesus' name. And it says, the Philistines are upon you. She was even rejoicing that your enemies have come. Samson, now demonstrate your power. And he awoke out of his mood and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself and wish not that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes. Put out his eyes. One person held him here. The other fellow held him here. Before this time, nobody could hold Samson. You cannot even tie this man. You cannot bind this man. But now somebody just held him and he took a knife. And this, they didn't put anesthetics. They didn't deaden the pain. And, and this man, he had never cried in his life. Samson cried for anything. A woman made him cry. And he put out his two eyes. That's why I brought you to the workers retreat and say, brothers and sisters, let us learn our lesson. Temptation coming from the world, temptation coming from the devil, I pray we will not yield. Because if you yield to temptation, I cannot tell you all the events, all the calamities, all the great evil things that will happen. And then it says, and they brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass. Now they bound him. They couldn't bind him and succeed before. He'll break everything. He did grind in the prison house. Then they took him to the prison. And he said, all the pepper that the other prisoners are going to use in taking their food, quick, begin to grind it. And Samson began to grind for the other prisoners. Think about it. That this temptation, yielding to temptation, made him to become like almost a piece of bread. But I pray God will deliver us. But as you look into the word of God and you see the shame that a person that yields into temptation will go through, you will tell the Lord, I will not yield. And God will help you. And this whole church is praying for you. If there is temptation coming your way, you can depend upon it. I'm praying for you. And we are all praying for you. I'm praying that we'll all make it on that final day in Jesus' name. And then what are trials? Trials are afflictions caused by Satan. Satan is always the cause. Caused by Satan to so inconvenience us that the pain and the trouble will make us to think of forsaking Christ and going back to Satan. Trials. These are afflictions. Afflictions caused by Satan. To so inconvenience us. That the trouble or the pain. Will make us think of forsaking Christ. And going back to Satan. Satan's purpose in temptation or trial. Is to so entice. And to so deceive. And to discourage. And bend us. In such a way that we'll get into his will and move in his way. What are the consequences of failure and falling? Already I've shown you part of it. Let's quickly run through this now. Our time is gone. In Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. From verse 13. They on the rock are they. Which when they hear. Receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. In time of temptation fall away. The consequence of yielding to temptation, of failing God and falling, is that we sheet from our base. We sheet from our commitment, consecration to the Lord. And we literally go away from the Lord. In time of temptation fall away. In 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 20. 
For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein, and overcome the latter end this was with them than the beginning. If a person yields to temptation, the latter end is worse than the beginning. Which means, when you are a sinner, it was bad enough. When you are a sinner, being the wrath and the judgment of God upon you, it was bad enough. When you are a sinner, with the wrath, the indignation, the judgment of God awaiting you, it was bad enough. But now you knew the Lord, and in the course of temptation, you fall back, you fall away. And it says, then the latter end is worse than the beginning. Verse 21, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it is happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again. And the so the, the swine, the pig that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. That's the consequence. When a person turns back into sin, when a person yields to temptation, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 5, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Our labor be in vain. What that means is that we've been laboring on you to get saved. And if you are saved and you keep saved, then we know that we have labored for something worthwhile. But then if you fall back, you fall away, you yield to temptation, then our labor will be in vain. It will be as if we didn't even do anything at all. As if you are not saved, as if we didn't labor for anyone to get saved. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, from verse 9, But they that will be rich fall into temptation. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Remember once again, there is a desire within the heart. The desire to be rich. The desire to have all material things in abundance. The desire to have a large bank account. The desire to have more money than so and so. In our family, we, we are three brothers, so we are four brothers. And all the others, this one is riding a car, that one is riding a car. And when am I going to ride a car? Because they are now saying that it's because I'm a Christian. That the others are getting on, I'm not getting on. And this brings a desire within you that by all means, at all costs, you must be rich all of a sudden. And they that will be rich, they that say, I must have riches or nothing else. They fall into temptation and snare, into many foolish and hurtful lusts. Many foolish and hurtful lusts. You know the kind of problem you fall into? The kind of problem you fall into, the temptations are so great in this world. You know, somebody comes to you and says, uh, um, I, can tell, I want to tell you something. Are you matured enough? Are you old enough to be, old, to be able to hold this in and not talk to any person? Oh, you say, you better trust me. I'll keep the information. Well, I've just discovered a big deal somewhere. And this one... If we do it, in fact, uh, you know, job or no job in Nigeria now, this one is enough to cut it. And this one is enough, you know, your family will just be at ease for the rest of life. And all it's going to take is that you are going to do this and that. And uh, you say, what is uh, this thing you are to Oh, he says, uh, I hope you say you are, you know, disciplined enough not to talk about this. You say, yes, I am. I say, that carton you see there. You may not know what is in that carton. But it is Naira. And not ordinary Naira. Not the one Naira, two, you know, five Naira, ten Naira. Not even the twenty Naira. I'm telling you that if you can keep your mouth, you say, where did you get it? Let's sit down, let's show the experiment. And brings Omo, and brings water, and brings ordinary something, and looks ordinary paper, and mixes something, and puts it like this. And when it comes out, that wet thing that is, you are looking at like this, you say, what? It is fifty Naira. Keep your mouth shut. They're all that cut on there. But you see, to be able to make the deal properly, um, you will, you know, you have to do something. You say, what is that? You say, first of all, go and bring 50,000 naira. Because what you find in there, we perform the experiment and settle everything. What you will get, you know, you don't need to work for the rest of your life. 
they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. That right there, you forget your salvation. You forget heaven. You forget the Bible. And you forget that your soul is in danger. You see, they that will be read, they will go almost any way, almost any length. They want to do anything that they will have, what their hearts are lost in after. And it says, they will get into the perdition, the destruction, which drown men's souls. In verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. That is the consequence of yielding to sin, of being what is evil. Our time is gone. The last point, triumph and reward of faithful pilgrims. I pray that as we come to this retreat, we'll triumph. We will overcome. The things that have overcome us in the past, the things that have made us to fall back and to backslide and to keep on backsliding. Backslide today, get restored. Tomorrow, backslide again, get restored. The following day, I believe all these things are going to stop in Jesus' name. Now, what do we do so that we can overcome temptation? So that we can become victorious, we can be triumphant over all the temptations coming our way. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. Matthew 26, verse 41. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Realize your flesh is weak. Don't expose your flesh to objects of temptation. Don't say, I am strong. I will stand. It does not matter. I want to go and do my own evangelism in the prostitute's hotel. I want to go and do my own um, evangelism in the, in the uh, place where they are gambling. I want to go and do my own evangelism in the place where these women are almost half naked, practicing evil. I'm going to snatch them away from hell. It says, I don't be overconfident. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Then in the trials of life, in the problems that come to discourage you, because trials will come, persecution will come, affliction will come. How do you stand? What do you do? Mark chapter 13. Verses 12 and 13. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son, and the children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. In all that affliction, look at this, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. He that shall endure unto the end, unto the end, the same shall be saved. As you have heard, temptations will definitely come. But I pray we endure till the end. You need to surround your life with prayer. Watch and pray. Two, you'll need to make sure there's watchfulness in your life. Keep your ears open to the Spirit of God. Keep your eyes open to the Word of God. Be very, very watchful. Have you found something that made other people to fall, made something to fall? Watch against it. Have you found something that made David to fall? Watch against it. Have you discovered something that made Simon Peter to fall and forsake the Lord? Watch against it. Have you discovered what made Sapphira and Anas and Sapphira to fall? Watch against it. Have you discovered what made Judas Iscariot to fall? Watch against it. Have you seen people that were stronger than you are? Not more knowledgeable than you are? More committed than you are? Either in the church in the past generations or in the church today. And you see that these things have made them to fall. You watch against it. Have you seen a fellow brother in your district? A fellow sister in your district that everybody was, you know, saying that this brother, this sister, we thank God for his life, we thank God for our life, and yet you've discovered something, something, something that makes that, that has made that brother to fall. And now she is like nothing. He is like nothing. What are you going to do? You will watch against those things that you see have made other people to fall. So then, number one in your life, 
There should be praying. Number two, there should be watching. Number three, fellowship. You see, it is fellowship with one another. Look at the fellowship we have now. What if you didn't come to this meeting? All these that were hearing, how could you hear? What if you lost this privilege of fellowship? The privilege of encouragement. The privilege of interaction with one another. Let there be fellowship. Number four, endurance. Willingness to suffer. Endurance. Willingness to suffer. Let there be that willingness within you that even if it is going to cause suffering, if I'm resisting temptation, if I don't agree with the offer of that boss in my place of work, if I don't agree with the pestering of this woman in our community or in my place of work, it may cause suffering and slander and criticism. I am going to stand. Endurance and willingness to suffer. Number five is faith. Faith in God. Knowing that we are kept by the power of God. And you can be kept. Have that faith in God. When temptation comes, don't say, oh, the time to fall has come. I will not be able to stand. Believe in God. He who saved you is able to keep you. Because in that he himself was tempted in all points and yet without sin. is able to succor us that are tempted also. Number six is faithfulness. In the private when the church members are not there, when the church leaders are not there, when the pastor is not there, but you have been taught the word of God, faithfulness to the obedience to that word of God, even though church members and leaders and the pastor may not be there, and faithfulness in the public. When the people are saying, ah, Mr. So-and-so, you want to say that uh, you cannot drink at all at all? So you are just a boy. You're not really a man. You're not really a strong fellow. Ah, uh, Mr. So and so, I hope you don't do this. I mean, this is the public. Look at all these women here. Look at all these men here. You mean that you are going to drink ordinary Fanta? You, you mean that you are not going to really uh, drink and become like a top man? You know, in that public, when people are teasing you and they want you to be able to deny the Lord and to be able to compromise the standard. Not as the time you'll be faithful, whether in private or in public. Number seven, look into the eternal reward in future. You now, every time temptation comes, you think of the reward. That if I use today's temptation, look at what I'm going to miss. You'll miss the crown. You'll miss the well done coming from God. You'll miss the eternal mansion that God has prepared for us. You will miss the, uh, the, the paradise, the, the heaven that everyone has been looking for. to. You will miss the time of the rapture. Let's close with Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Look at what we have suffered already. The persecution we have suffered, the self-denial we are going through, the work we are doing for God, and how we are making ourselves by the grace of God, just to obey the word of God. Look at in your own family when you became born again, how they made jest of you, how they call you names, how they try to tell you that you are almost like a black leg, a black goat in the family because you are the only one that has gone to take the gospel fully like this. And look at the things they have said in your place of work. Look at the ridicule. Look at the persecution that you have endured. At the end of enduring everything, when a crown should be waiting for you to lose out, to yield to temptation, and then for God to say, I never knew you. I mean, here you are now in the kingdom of God. You have repented. You are born again. You have suffered. You have given up a lot of things. What restitutions have you not made? And what shame has not been put upon you? What names have they not called you? But only because of the flesh. Only because of money. Only because of idol worship. Only because of impatience. Only because of a particular need in your life. You yield to temptation. And eventually God says, where are you coming from? I never knew you. Depart from me. Ye that walk in iniquity. I pray it will never be so. So whatever is happening, let's pray that we're going to endure. And we're going to stand. That when temptation comes, 
we are going to so pray for the grace of God that will stand and we will not fall. Let's rise up and pray. What temptation is the devil bringing your way? Are you resisting that temptation? What is the lost in your heart being? Not in a desire in your heart. What are the thoughts the devil is bringing to trouble you, to deceive you, to lead you astray, to make you to go back? Is it because of marriage? You don't find anybody to marry in the kingdom of God and therefore the temptation is to go into the world? Is it because of inordinate desire to make money, make money, make money at all costs? What temptations are you battling with and what temptations are you yielding to? Don't give in to the devil. Don't give in to the tempter. Don't give in to the temptress. Crucify the flesh. Crucify the flesh and the lusts or the desires thereof. Will you be an overcomer? Or are you going to allow the devil to overcome you, temptation to overcome you, sin to overcome you? Pray. Watch and pray that you do not fall into temptation. Don't let anyone take your crown or take eternal life away from you. This is the time to pray so you can have the strength of God. This is the time to pray so you can receive forgiveness and cleansing because of all the yielding that you have done to the devil. This is the time to repack your load and to make your consecrations again and to tell the Lord you mean to continue with him forever. Will you be an overcomer? Will you be an overcomer? Will you be an overcomer? Watch and pray that you do not fall into temptation. 
Resist the devil. Resist the devil. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Resist the devil. Resist the devil. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you.